high levels of body fat versus high levels of blood sugar. What is actually worse for the brain, for the body, for inflammation, for our hormones? There's so much emphasis right now on lowering blood sugar, and I think that's very important, but it gets us confused. What do we focus on first? Should we focus on losing the body fat or should we focus on lowering blood sugar and losing body fat will follow? I think we need to prioritize and understand what's more important. Let's dive right in. Let's look at the brain first. There was a study published in BMC Neurology. It was very interesting that demonstrated that the higher levels of body fat and the higher levels of BMI were associated with a less overall white matter density and gray matter volume. The brain was literally smaller and had less neuronal activity in someone that was high BMI, high body fat. Okay, that doesn't tell us everything. Let's look at more data. There was a study published in Brain Imaging and Behavior that looked at what is called a fiber bundle length in the white matter. This is a relatively new marker that's being looked at now, but essentially it tells us the length of fibers that are in the white matter, which is what kind of allows neuronal signaling to occur. They found in people that were high body fat and high BMI that these were significantly less and significantly shorter in the temporal lobe of these people that were overweight. And what does this mean? The temporal lobe is responsible for like receiving auditory cues and being able to learn from that. It's associated with memory. Okay, so what we can see as far as brain volume is concerned is that having high body fat seems to be, based on larger scale objective data, really bad. But we have to look at bigger pieces. We have to look at glucose. And we also have to look at cognition as well. Regardless of whether it's high body fat or high blood sugar, one thing that we need to be paying attention to is our gut microbiome. I put a link down below for 30% off of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. I don't really recommend probiotics very often, but Seed has a very, very interesting one. And that's a 30% off discount link. So they have a capsule inside of a capsule. So it has a prebiotic and a probiotic in one. So if you're trying to really make a dent in your gut microbiome and make a serious change, that's probably the only probiotic I would ever recommend. So again, that link down below, will get your hands on that for a 30% off discount, and then you can try taking it every day. So because it's a symbiotic, that means that it has like a multi-stage delivery system. So it has a prebiotic that breaks down, which is going to help feed the gut bacteria and help feed the probiotic, which breaks down a little bit later in digestion with their dual capsule technology. So anyhow, that link is down below for 30% off with seed. As far as the brain and blood sugar is concerned, there was a study published in PLOS1 that was intriguing. This found that type two diabetics with high blood sugar had less white matter network efficiency. Independent of any brain volume actual size, they weren't able to send signals as effectively. But what was really interesting is that when they looked at HbA1c, the higher the HbA1c, the longer their glucose levels have been elevated for a longer period of time, there is a dose dependent relationship with that same efficiency. So basically, the longer they've had high glucose, the less functional their brain was, and they actually saw legitimate functional damage to the brain itself. But we have to ask ourselves the question, why? Like, why does body fat do this, and why does glucose do this? Now, with high levels of glucose, we have somewhat of an answer, because we've seen in some fMRI data that it tends to damage the arteries that supply the brain. So high glucose can damage the arteries that supply the brain with oxygen. Less oxygen to the brain, obviously, is going to be the death of neurons, and the brain's gonna not be able to grow and flourish. Pretty cut and dry, but still pretty terrible. But then when you look at more data, you also find there's a level of neurotoxicity that occurs. So when these vessels that are damaged, they're unable to clear out byproducts, unable to clear out things like beta amyloid plaque, right? So even things that are somewhat associated with neurodegenerative conditions, in layman's terms, what this means is the brain is almost landlocked. It's like cut off from supply, but also gets cut off from being able to clear out. So the brain just becomes sort of a toxic wasteland. Now with body fat, there's a number of different influential factors. So right now it's still kind of neck and neck, like what's actually worse? Well with this we need to look at cognition. We need to actually look at how the brain functions. So with this we look at a study that was published in JAMA that looked at over 9,000 people. And it found that high levels of body fat, once again, were associated with vascular damage. Now, interestingly enough, they didn't just look at body fat with this, they also looked at visceral adipose tissue. And it seems as though visceral adipose tissue played an even stronger role. What that means is that subcutaneous adipose tissue, regular fat is just the fat that's around our body, our belly, our arms, whatever. Visceral adipose tissue is directly surrounding our organs and it's what gives you a pot belly. And we have some more data on this that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. 
But the simple fact here is that there was an impact on cognitive function. But then when we look at glucose, there was a study that was published uh, that took a look at HbA1c and was published in Diabetes Care. It found that the higher the HbA1c, the lower the overall testing scores on multiple different cognitive testing batteries. So in true actual data with large scale populations, the higher the glucose, the higher the HbA1c, the lower they would perform on cognitive tests. Okay, well, I'm a mechanistic guy. Like I love that large scale data, but I need to understand the mechanisms so that I can understand how do we potentially mitigate this issue. So with this, we come dead center into inflammation. Body fat causes inflammation, high levels of blood sugar cause inflammation. All of these things affect the brain. So what's the best way to sort of target this? Well, there was a study that was published in Lipids and Health and Disease that took a look at body fat tissue and how it affected C-reactive protein. There is a very clear link between high levels of body fat and high levels of inflammation through C-reactive protein and also through direct cytokines like interleukin-6. But we look at another study that was really intriguing because it looked specifically at subcutaneous adipose tissue and visceral adipose tissue. What they found is that subcutaneous adipose tissue as well as visceral adipose tissue were very strongly correlated with CRP, with interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, uh, adhesion molecules, but also monocyte chemoattractant proteins, MCT1s. These are like kind of the beginning of an inflammatory response. But hear me out on this. What was really interesting is when they adjusted for confounders with this data, meaning they looked at all the pieces and they said, okay, well, let's actually add in BMI, let's add in waist to hip ratio and all this stuff. They found that only visceral adipose tissue was really the problem. This is really important because what this essentially is telling us is that even people with high levels of body fat, if they did not have high levels of visceral fat, they didn't really have as much inflammation. So although we know fat is inflammatory, what's really inflammatory is the visceral adipose tissue. And that is what we do seem to see being more powerful in a negative way than high levels of glucose. Interestingly enough though, when we look at blood sugar, there was a study that demonstrated both in vitro and in vivo that when fat cells were exposed to high levels of glucose, it would trigger a vast amount of reactive oxygen species. So a significant amount of oxidative stress, which then in turn caused a significant inflammatory response. So on one hand, we have visceral adipose tissue, which directly causes inflammation. And on the other hand, we have blood sugar, which sort of indirectly causes it. But when we look at all the objective data here, it seems as though body fat is worse. If we know that body fat is a bigger problem, we need to look at some other stuff as well. Because the more that body fat increases, the more we have a hormonal disadvantage that really makes it even worse. For example, if our body fat is elevated, then we also have an increase in what is called the aromatase hormone, specifically in, or enzymes, specifically in men, right? What this does is this converts testosterone into estrogen. And there was an interesting study that looked at this that's kind of scary. It was published in the FASEB journal. And what they found is that for every 5% increase in body fat, there was a significant increase in the ratio of estrogen to sex hormone binding globulin. So in other words, there was an increase in free bioavailable estrogen. This is a very big problem if it's happening in this fashion as we increase body fat, because that's gonna lead to low libido, that's gonna lead to like developing breasts, that's gonna lead to serious fatigue, lack of muscle, like, and it ends up making it so that you can gain more fat, because the more estrogen you have, the more fat you develop, the more fat you develop, the more estrogen you develop, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just one side it's feeding off of each other. When we look at glucose and how glucose affects hormones, the only real data that we have suggests that high glucose affects our hunger hormones, affects things like ghrelin, leptin, things like that. And yes, it can certainly influence other hormones. It can influence testosterone and things like that. But the data is just not nearly as strong as it is with body fat affecting our hormones negatively. So the conclusion here is we do need to focus on body fat first, but what's gonna happen if we reduce body fat, does it ultimately affect glucose? And if we reduce glucose, does it automatically affect body fat? The short answer is yes, but you have to pick a side where to start. Because if you were to say, I'm only gonna focus on lowering my blood sugar, and you don't factor in the things that you need to pay attention to to lose body fat, you aren't taking the quickest path 
to making yourself feel better, controlling inflammation, and improving your brain function. But if you focus first on saying, hey, I need to lose weight, this is number one, and I'm gonna focus on blood sugar later on, that is usually a quicker path. Because once the weight starts to come off, the inflammation goes down, and then you have a better control of your blood sugar. Because here's what we have to remember. Blood sugar can absolutely be driven up by high levels of inflammation. Inflammation is sort of like the cloudiness that impedes a signal from insulin to a cell. So if you have high levels of inflammation by purely having high levels of body fat, then your blood sugar is naturally going to be elevated anyway. Now, if your blood sugar is elevated, it can certainly contribute to fat accumulation, but not as easy as fat can contribute to high blood sugar. So one of the things that I've always learned in business and in life is you quote unquote work closest to the money first and work backwards, right? So that means you go for the low hanging fruit. What is the low hanging fruit here? You can have a bigger impact on your overall health by losing the weight first and the blood sugar follows. That being said, if you're in a situation where your blood sugar is very, very bad and you're in a dire situation, of course you need to control that. But what most people and most clinicians and practitioners would say is that if you get the weight under control, that will fall into place next. Now with that, doing things like taking 12 hour breaks between your dinner and your breakfast. That's a perfect way to A, reduce your caloric intake because you're shrinking your eating period, but B, it's also giving you a chance to stabilize glucose levels, okay? Also, by not eating three hours before bed, that makes a very big difference. By having very clear defined gaps in between your meals, because what this is gonna do is gonna make it so your hormones have a chance to come down. Insulin has a chance to come down. You have a chance to burn fat. So because of that, not only are you burning fat in between meals, you are also allowing glucose levels to come down. So a lot of the things that you do to lose weight are also good for glucose management. Every time you eat, you should try to move a little bit afterwards. Why? Because it's gonna control the glucose a little bit better, but it's also gonna burn the calories. So you see where we're going, it's really two sides of the same coin. You just have to pick the angle first. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.